I would like to um, welcome everybody um, to the uh, first week's final day of our Atom Tonics at Abu Dhabi meeting. And I'm very excited about um, uh, all of you and all the great talks. And I'm happy to, to look forward to a session uh, of esteemed speakers today, which will round up um, the first week of the meeting. And uh, just let me remind you again on two things. First of all, um, uh, we are very happy that um, the Technology Innovation Institute in Abu Dhabi is uh, hosting our meeting uh, very successfully with a lot of support. And we want to like uh, uh, I allow myself in the name of all of the organizers to thank all the staff at Abu Dhabi and Luigi taking care of that um, for this uh, great turnout of the first week. And of course, we have the second week um, also to come. Um, I would like to use the occasion of this introduction again to mention a few things. So the, the uh, actual number is that we have uh, 540 participants now, which is a tremendous turnout. And of course, um, this is one of the uh, advantages of an online meeting that we have so many participants following us. Um, we have a tight program today again. So um, I would like to ask all the speakers uh, to stay within a lot of time. And of course, I know that we have five minutes over time already. And um, I uh, will allow myself to give you a notice 10 minutes before the regular end of your talk and another one five minutes before the regular end of uh, your talk. And then I will cut you off at the end. No, uh, then, I, then I will be more strict at the end of your talk. So please uh, keep uh, watching me if I wave my hands um, to, uh, to announce the, that your time is coming up. For all the participants, um, you know by now that we have um, two ways um, the, of question and answer. So please don't use the chat, use the question and answer box for the ones who are not allowed to speak. And of course, the ones who um, are allowed to speak, they can raise their hands at the end of the talk. But we do questions at the end of the talks, not to interrupt the talks. And I will uh, try to curate the, uh, the, the question session at the end of the talk. And um, I would like to finish up uh, this short introduction by giving the word to Luigi, who wanted to make a small announcement. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, just a couple of minutes. Say, uh, some of you uh, assisted the exchange, my exchange uh, with Kevin Wright yesterday. So I already talked with Kevin, but I want to repeat now. Say, independently on the subject, I would like to ask uh, uh, Kevin to accept my apologies. I say, uh, for, the, for, for the way, not for the... And uh, say, I would like to also to remark that our community wants to be really a collegial space in which uh, we really help each other. Okay, thanks. So thank you very much. And thank now I, give, um, I, I invite uh, Maxime to share a screen already and I give a small introduction to our first speaker. Our first speaker is Maxime Aljani, well known uh, to many of us. Um, he's professor at physics um, at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. And Maxim really started out with the pioneers of laser cooling in Russia before he moved over various stages. And he has a long, a long uh, track record in a wide range of aspects of ultra cold atom physics. And this includes laser cooling and trapping, um, um, uh, experimental work uh, on that interaction of um, cold bosonic and fermionic systems, um, solitons and quantum macroscopic coherence. And um, in, in, in he's famous um, for his live demonstrations at the Atomtronics meetings. The, one thing we cannot have today, the Galileo Canon was very impressive in the last, last meeting. And we're very, uh, looking very much forward, uh, Maxime, to your talk. And um, you go about tweezers, you go about triangular systems, and you go on lax integrability and cheap macroscopic quantum coherence with the cross Pedieski breathers. So please go ahead, Maxime, the stage is yours. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for the, for the introduction. So, so first of all, thank, uh, thanks to all the organizers to, to actually to organizing this impressive series. And uh, I'm very glad the series will, will go on. And it, this, it is a complete success and especially for organizing, uh, and especially organizing this very session that was really uh, in, organized in conditions close to to a battlefield, and um, so so again again this shows that this this whole meeting will 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 be it will continue being a complete success in the future. So the um, 
my presentation presentation today is really a result of a collaboration of of, of three groups. So, so our group at UMass Boston, so experimental group uh, led by Randy Hewlett at the Rice University, and and a group at, at, at in, in Tel Aviv University. And so so I'm going to talk talk to you about the. Uh, how to use uh, gross Petrievsky breathers to uh, control uh, macroscopic coherence and how, how to probably build, build some, some actual devices uh, using uh, quantum macroscopic coherence in, in breathers. Uh, right, so, so uh, yes. Um, so this, this is my place of work. So this is, uh, so our university is surrounded from three sides by uh, by the ocean, and this is where my my office is. So with an ocean view and, and everything, and uh, our students they sail for the lunch break. Uh, so as an introduction, I'm going to, to start from a particular quote uh, from Richard Feynman. I I should tell you that I strongly disapprove the message in this quote. So so it shows um, uh, Feynman's dislike for topology in particular and for mathematicians in general, but the quote serves as a useful um, uh, simile to introduce something that, that I want to introduce to you. And the quote goes as follows. So, um, and that's, that's Feynman's um, attitude towards topology. So Feynman says, um, I had a scheme, which I still use today when somebody is explaining s s something that I'm trying to understand. So I keep making up examples. So for instance, uh, the mathematicians would come to me with a terrific theorem and they're all excited. And they're telling me uh, the conditions of the theorem. And as they tell me the conditions of the theorem, I construct something in my mind that fits all the conditions. And for example, they say, imagine you have a set and the, the set is a set in, in, the, in, in, the, in the topological sense. And I'm, uh, I'm imagining a ball. And then they say, they say, oh, the set is disjoint. So I'm imagining two balls. And then, then they start adding things. The balls turn, turn colors, they grow hairs, uh, whatever, some, some other conditions. And then they say something like, uh, yes, so, so these two balls are going to fit into this, this pirate's uh, chest. And, uh, and I see in my mind, he sees that, that they don't. And I say, I say, False. And now I'm going to tell you something which, which would sound very similar. So take a cluster of self gravitating, self, uh, self attracting matter with a coupling constant G naught. Okay, so clusters, I mean, we have clusters. So, so we have helium, helium clusters, we have, we have, after all, maybe we have stars. Quench the coupling constant up by a factor of four. Okay, this is this this is so far normal. It will split onto exactly two clusters. Okay. And at this stage, you say what? Because uh, what does it even mean to split onto two clusters when 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 they sit sit on top of each other? I mean, they don't change color, they don't change internal state. How do you even count? And that's that's where your doubt doubt start. But imagine you believe it splits onto two clusters. Uh, so then I say with zero relative velocity, and you would say maybe. I mean, if one believes that that um, that there are exactly two clusters, then then it's clear that that from the symmetry, relative velocity must be zero because we don't know which way which way it is going to be oriented. <clears throat> but it's going to get worse, and uh, and especially in the explanation of what what these two clusters really means and how I count and it's going to be much much worse because next next the, the next thing that I'm going to say is these two clusters don't interact and at this point you say again false but the GPE solitons so our clusters they do exactly that and the two non-interacting clusters they form what's called a GPE Breezer. And returning back, so if you believe if you believe that these two clusters, whatever they are, they don't interact, the the very first question on on what what it means precisely to have two and exactly two clusters 
has has a perfect sense. You divide your your atomic ensemble into two parts, and these two parts don't interact, and um, and and thus and thus uh, 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 so so everything else follows. But one one need, needs to believe that they don't interact. So what is it? Um, so what is a uh, Gross-Tierski breather? So take a ground state of an attractive BC in one dimension. So, so that's that's a soliton, and quench the coupling constant uh, by a factor of four up. And it will start breathing, but uh, what what we'll learn uh, what we'll learn pretty soon, uh, this breathing is in fact some sort of interference between two solitons of smaller sizes. And this effect was predicted in in uh, in the famous uh, Zaharov Shabbat paper in in uh, of, of 1972. Uh, so breezers has been realized exp realized experimentally already. Uh, so so first in the group of Elmer Elmer Haller, uh, and then in the group of Re uh, Randy Hewlett, and I'm also, and, and my group is is also in the list of in the list of authors. Uh, and in the group of Randy Hewlett, uh, the the, uh, the breezers were not only realized but also characterized. So so here you see a plot of the RMS widths as a function of time. There's no fit, fit parameters. And this curve comes straight from the Harav Shabbat paper. And then here Vladimir Zaharov looks, looks at this curve uh, approvingly. And so, so, so breezes are already, uh, gross precision breezes are already a reality. And so recall what, 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 what we have indeed. So we have, uh, we have two, uh, sitting one on top of another, uh, another that don't interact. And now remember that the center of mass motion of this uh, of the system, it remains hot. And even, even, even while it, it, uh, it is hot because it's pretty hard to, to cool the center of mass of the, of the mother soliton, the relative motion, simply because of this, of the symmetry, simply, simply because the relative motion wouldn't know which way, which way to go, left, le left or right. The relative motion remains quantum cold. So let's add fluctuations to actually to see that that indeed a breezer consists of two solitons. So I start from a single BC soliton with a coupling constant, constant G0. I add a small noise to the wave function, not, not to the potential, but I made this small, small noise, small white noise to, to, to the wave function. Quench the Howell coupling constant by a factor of two and let it propagate. And what I see is that at some time, at some stage, uh, the, the the breezer, the original breezer, starts decomposing onto two onto two solitons. And if we wait uh, for for time long enough, so we'll see them, and the mass ratio between them will be exactly exactly one to three, as predicted in in the Harav Shabbat paper. Uh, so remember that the separation. The, the size of the separation is governed by the strength of the initial noise. So, 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 and uh, and and this noise can be anything. I mean, this noise could, could be artificial. This noise could, could be experimental. But in, but also, this noise could be just the quantum microscopic noise on top of the mother soliton. And this is precisely what what, what we want to do. Uh, so, and uh, the solitons have a great advantage for for interferometry, in my view as opposed to uh, large molecules. And the advantage is, is that in solitons, you have a gap, an energy gap between the ground state, which is a pure soliton, and, and the excitations. And the excitations are the delocalized Boglebus excitations. This gap, mind you, grows as we, uh, as we increase the number of particles in, this, in, the, in the soliton, unlike in large molecules, where uh, the, the more atoms you add to your, to, to your fullerens, the denser is the vibrational spectrum, and the uh, the faster is the decoherence of the center of mass motion of the Fuller fullerene to the internal uh, to the internal exc excitations. And so, the, and so this is why, uh, to my knowledge, most of the experiments in um, macroscopic quantum coherence with large molecules is is done in the near field because you have to do it do it fast. Uh, before the decoherence to the internal degrees of freedom happens, so we do have we do, do have some time, and so the only thing the so so the what comes from quantum fluctuations is 
the zero point quantum fluctuations of the Bogolubov's excitations on top of the mother soliton. And these fluctuations, the part of them goes into the fluctuations of the relative velocity and the relative position of the daughter solitons uh, produced in a quench. And here I just used the very same movie because I didn't tell about the scale of quantum fluctuations, but, but, but now, so you should imagine that this, this separation after some propagation time is governed by the initial uh, zero point quantum noise uh, uh, on top of the mother soliton, so, so which, is, which is entirely, quite, entirely quantum macroscopic. There is a number of particles sitting in this noise. And so what we've created, so this is, this is what you are going to see if you detect a few atoms in, in the solitons. And if you don't, if you decide to, to propagate it further, so, so the, the states with, with different distances between the solitons, they would form a minimum Heisenberg uncertainty wave packet of a massive macroscopic degree of freedom. So, so this is not, uh, uh, akin to, to, to a Schrodinger cat. So, so, so this is again, so, so the relative distance between two massive objects uh, forms a minimum uncertainty wave packet. So, so, so what are the predictions? So we had, we had three theories. So, so one is one comes from beta ansatz for less than, less than 20, 20 atoms. Uh, we use two types of global theory. So one, one with a white noise, or just, just, just for an estimate, and then with a correlated noise, um, quantum noise on top of the mother soliton. So we have a particular prediction for the quantum RMS relative velocity of the, of, of the two solitons. And they can be converted to the experimental times. And so, so, so at the moment, we need a few seconds to, to, to see the separation, but, but, uh, but we can, I mean, uh, so, so this, this, this number can, can be shortened as we will see by applying an inverted harmonic potential. So, so it, is, it is not entirely out of reach uh, experimentally to see, to see the spatial separation governed by the quantum fluctuations. Uh, all right, and so, um, all right, and now, and now instead, of, uh, instead of actually seeing this separation uh, uh, between the solitons, we may think about proceeding further and actually using the, uh, the quantum nature of the wave packet of the relative motion to, uh, to attempt uh, to, uh, to reach uh, quantum advantage in, in, some, in, in some measurement. And so consider a particular uh, temporal sequence of uh, external harmonic potential. So consider a particular uh, temporal sequence. So we, so we prepare our breather initially. So that's, and so here I'm plotting the uh, uh, effectively the Wigner's wave function of the relative distance between the solitons uh, in the space of intersoliton distance and intersoliton velocity. So, and this is, this is the state we prepare initially. Uh, so it's in these units, it is slightly more elongated along, along, the, uh, along the velocity axis, but I mean, it's, it's all about units. But what is important, what is not governed by the units, but what is uni universal is that the area uh, of this blob scales as uh, Planck's constant and is inversely proportional to the number of particles, um, uh, in, the number of particles in the, in the mother soliton. Uh, what is also important is that if you re-express it in terms of uh, intersoliton distance and intersoliton canonical momentum, this area will be of the order of, of, of the Planck's constant. So what do we do next? Instead of detecting, instead of waiting uh, for the quantum noise to show the solitons, we don't. We keep the coherence, so, so we, don't, we don't want to, to actually to to, uh, we don't want to collapse the wave function, func uh, function of relative motion by, by an accidental measurement. Instead, we're applying a direct harmonic, harmonic potential for a one eighth of a period. And what we, what we achieve here is that now we have this blob oriented at plus 45 degrees uh, along the diagonal. So what we do next is we apply an inverted harmonic potential. And remember in inverted harmonic trajectories are not circles anymore. They are hyper hyper hyperbolic. And so, and so in particular, our blob that was oriented along uh, the plus 45 degrees gets elongated along one of the two principal axes, axes of, of this, this hyperbola. 
And the elongation can be made purely macroscopic. So elongation, usually, so you elongate it for as long uh, as, as, as your experimental apparatus. So, so in particular here, we stretch it by, by about 200 soliton lengths, uh, which, is still, which is still doable. But what's important is that the area, again, of this blob is extremely small. And thus the angle this needle makes, and, and I even brought, brought an actual old uh, amperometer to, to, to show that, that it, is, it, it can usually it really be used as a needle. So, so the width of this needle, an angle width of this needle is again proportional to h bar over n. And also another another interesting thing is that if you have a bigger apparatus, or if you if you perform this this this, this experiment in space where there's no sagging, so you um, you you also gain a factor of one or l square in the separation between the solitons in in this inverted harmonic potential. Uh, so I still <clears throat> keep my wave, uh, my, my wave packet coherent. And now I'm applying a direct, a direct uh, harmonic potential, again, of the same frequency for a quarter of a period, plus an unknown acceleration gradient. So I'm, I'm assuming that there is a correction to, my, to the curvature of my trap. Uh, it could be also a, a, an additional force, but relative motion actually is insensitive to to, an ex, to external forces. This is this is the advantage of, in fact, of doing everything with with harmonic potentials. That, that the, the relative motion is completely decoupled throughout throughout the process. And so, uh, and there's a known a known correction to the to the curvature of the trap, a known acceleration gradient. And so what I'm seeing here is, is okay, so, so I rotate my cloud by, by 90 degrees. So, so now it is at minus 45 degrees to the horizontal. The needle is still there, but the orientation of the needle now will be, will be proportional to this unknown acceleration gradient. So what we're measuring here is not amperes, but, but now unknown acceleration gradient. And finally, I, I'm applying an inverted harmonic potential again. And what happens there is that depending on what gradient, uh, gradient are, are applied, so if I apply a gradient, this, the final cloud become, becomes broader and it effectively depletes the central area. And if I, if I monitor the number of, of the solitons that, that were detected uh, in a close proximity to each other. So, so this number will be sensitive to the acceleration gradient I want, I want to measure. And so what happens, what happens is that at the, this last stage, so there's an inverted harmonic potential. If there is no uh, acceleration gradient, so my relative motion will, will, will try to linger on, on the top of the inverted harmonic. And the, uh, in order to link in the widths, the energy widths of my initial wave packet is again inversely proportional to the number, number of particles. So if there is an acceleration gradient, I will overshoot and I will actually miss the top at the moment of detection. And if there is a negative acceleration gradient, I will never reach the top. And here is what we get. It, it first, first of all, in a simple model where we only looked at the macroscopic, macroscopic degrees of freedom. So, so never mind. It is um, the the <clears throat> the rotation defect in the phase space is uh, um, uh, so. So what we're measuring is a probability of the intersoliton distance to get in a particular window, and we optimize this window. And the, this peak is narrow, and the width of this peak is again proportional to the acceleration gradient. And, uh, and what is more important is that the width of the peak scales inversely proportional to the to the number of particles. And now, of course, I mean, the moment comes. So we have experimental realities. Okay, and there's many, there's many things uh, we, uh, we need to take into, into account. And many things start, start going wrong when you, when you take into account the actual atoms. So first of all, we, have, we don't have ideal one-dimensional waveguides. There is also transverse motion. And due to this transverse motion, so the main effect of the transverse motion is that as uh, interactions get stronger, the transverse wave packet is no longer the Gaussian. It, it, it gets actually narrower. And it effectively adds, it adds attractive and changes the one-dimensional equation of state because 
because the uh, three-dimensional density inc uh, increase is more rapid in the real three-dimensional waveguide as it is in, in, the, in the idealized waveguide. We get, uh, we get additional interactions. And it turns out that if you don't apply an inverted harmonic potential, uh, uh, so there is no soliton solid soliton separation after the quench. So, so they get attracted uh, to each other by beyond 1D forces. And this effect is very similar to a similar effect of, uh, observed in, in, in two dimensions with a two dimensional, um, two dimensional Bose gases uh, in the group of, of Ellen Perang. So, 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 so there, there indeed there's an additional contribution to the two dimensional equation of state because the transverse transfer state is not entirely the ground state of the, of the corresponding trap. So this can be cured by the inverted harmonic potential, which we need anyways. So, uh, so if you wait, so now if you look, look at, at, at this movie, if you wait for long enough, inverted harmonic will separate, finally rip the part and they would hap happily part company and, 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 and flow away. But of course, uh, of course, nothing, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's never, I mean, it's, it's uh, okay, li life is hard. And so, and so it turns out that if you apply in the harmonic and, and keep, keep increasing the strength of the inverted harmonic potential, the tidal forces, that uh, inert harmonic potential creates will start ripping solitons apart. And in this movie, which is pretty short, let me show it again. So the way you're going to see is, is at first you will have large soliton and small soliton interfering and the small soliton would want to leave, but before it leaves, it, it is ripped apart and, and flies, flies to infinity uh, uh, as a thermal, thermal part. You see there are these two waves and, and in fact, what, what happened was, was that the smaller soliton simply evaporated uh, by, the tidal, by the tidal forces. This is why you should, should never try to approach a black hole because, because you will have too large gradient uh, of the gravity force acting on your legs and on your, um, on your head. And if you decide to approach a black hole, you should, you should, you should actually, you should lie tangentially to the, um, to the horizontal. Uh, so, so this would minimize the, the, the tidal forces. Uh, also, there is a residual soliton soliton interaction due to the harmonic trap because solitons have a final extent, finite extent, and uh, averaged uh, harmonic trap averaged over, over the soliton extent, it reduces a non integrable uh, correction to the, uh, to the interaction potential. And in particular, so this correction depends on the sign of the curvature of your harmonic trap. So uh, for, a, for, a, for a direct harmonic, the um, Inter additional interaction will be positive, and for inverted harmonic, it will, it will create a dip. And this interaction will also depend on the relative phase between the solitons. So finally, we, dis we decided we include all of it just without thinking, and so we do truncate the Wigner. And so, so we propagate the gross Petrievsky exactly, and we generate the, an, ensemble, an ensemble of initial states from, uh, we generate an ensemble of initial states uh, from um, the uh, uh, from the initial so from from the uh, quantum microscopic calculations given given by the uh, given uh, given by uh, by Bogolyubov, and so so what do we see? Okay, so 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 what 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 do we have here? Uh, all right, and so so at the moment statistics in, in truncated Wigner is not is not is not that great. So we need we need, need many more many more points. But uh, so as we play with the widths of this um, um, of the intersolid and distance. So so let me explain what, what what we're seeing here. So so we go through the sequence. So let me let me show you the sequence. Uh, just a second. So we go through, we again go through the sequence. So, so we prepare, prepare a breather. We rotate by, uh, by one eighth of a period, apply the inverted harmonic, expand, rotate, rotate with, uh, uh, with, with an unknown correction to the, uh, to the harmonic frequency.
and then uh, get to the get to the inverted harmonic, and finally, finally detect uh, detect our our solitons. So, so detect the, the relative distance between uh, between the two solitons, and this this relative distance will be fluctuating due to the quantum fluctuations in the initial state. And then we choose a window. So, so we, choose, we choose a particular window in the intersoliton distance. And what we measure is, out of our ensemble, what we measure is a probability for the intersoliton distance to get into this window. And, and the window you can, you can optimize. And we played with many of them. And it turns out that, that the results don't depend much on, on, on it. Okay, so let me let me go back to what where we were. Uh, just a second. So, up, 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 up. So all of that. Right. Okay. And so so here we're choosing a window um, of a width which is one forty one of of, of 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 a solid on size. And uh, and horizontally again. So what I'm what I'm really plotting here is the um, rotation angle in the phase space. So so uh, and and so defect uh, to the rotation angle in the phase space uh, uh, induced by an unknown correction to the to the traveling uh, curvature. So the number of particles is fifty four thousand. So so the Scattering length is out of out of out of the toolbox for the for the for lithium seven experiments. Uh, all, all the numbers are normal, and so the um, the expansion is. I mean, the harmonic expansion, the inert harmonic expansion, is really is really short, and so uh, initially it expands to uh, to a few hundred of of the soliton sizes. Uh, here, indeed, two two hundred thirty two. And so what we're seeing is okay, wings that go up and down, and a central peak. And so, so the width of the central peak is, I mean, you you, you see what it is. And now, it, the sad moment. So, so this all of that so it needs needs to come to the to the actual numbers, and the actual numbers are of course not not. To, I mean, they're, they're nothing to compare to the actual precision measurement. Numbers. I think yeah. In my note, ten minutes to go. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. So so and and so the uh, the if you if I were to measure a correction to the trapping frequency um, in in the period of this T over four rotation, so I would be able to measure a correction to a direct trapping frequency, which is uh, ten to the uh, 10, uh, 10 to the minus five two pi two pi hertz, which is okay, which is which is not that a small number. If I were to measure acceleration gradient, so I would be able to measure an acceleration gradient of one million was and I don't know what the what the plural of was is uh, because um, uh, so so probably it's apostrophe s, uh, which is roughly three hundred and twenty. Uh, gravitational gradients of Earth. Uh, so if you are you are standing on the surface, and for your information, so one L was is an acceleration gradient is is a gradient of G. Uh, you would experience if uh, an adult person approaches you uh, by by two meters. So so this is the acceleration gradient from 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 a human two meters away away from you. But the important point is, is that all these numbers, they scale down as the Planck's constant and they scale proportion, inversely proportional to the number, num, 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 numbers of atoms. So you can keep everything the same. So you can keep the, uh, the size of the apparatus the same. Uh, you would probably need to, to scan the, uh, the coupling constant. So, so, so if you keep, uh, so, so you you can you you have to keep the um, the size of the soliton and 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 and, and everything, but uh, but uh, so nothing will be changing. Just the accuracy will be increasing as you grow, as you grow the number of atoms in 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 the soliton. And so so this is and if this is ever experimentally demonstrated, I mean it would it would at least give a demonstration of a proof of principle that that we can have. Uh, 
we can have a quantum advantage, uh, quantum macroscopic advantage in uh, in precision measurement. Again, I'm not here after the break, uh, groundbreaking figures, but I want to show that um, that indeed, I mean, so, so everything scales inversely proportion to n. So in summary, we looked at the process of a quench of the coupling constant by a factor of two uh, uh, from a soliton. Uh, so we, what we created this quantum macroscopic unbounded degree of freedom. Uh, and it's it's uh, and and what is and the so degree of freedom is a relative distance between between the daughters within the daughter solitons in a breezer. All that so there's no LHY correction. Uh, everything all of that is created in ambient mean field conditions, and this is a beauty. This is akin to the uh, to the quantum anomaly, uh, and so so quantum microscopic effects are small, but since the interaction between the soliton is zero. They're the only thing that remain, uh, remain. And this is why you can see quantum patients because, because there's nothing for them to compete with, not because our, not because our apparatus is extremely, uh, extremely precise. And the quantum advantage indeed grows, um, in, improves as one of a number of, a number of particles. So all of that has been published in six papers. So ranging from far-fetching proposal to use to use four solitons and to use a four, four, uh, four soliton system to to uh, to improve the um, the precision measurement to uh, papers which have, which were very close to the experiment basically basically shadowing the shadowing the future experiments and all of that is crowned by actual experimental paper uh, coming from the Randy Hewitt group and uh, and, uh, and 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 my group and the group and uh, Boris Milamed and Vladimir Yurovsky from Tel Aviv. They are they are in and uh, Oleg Smarchukov. They they are also on on, on the paper. So all, all three all three towns uh, together: uh, Boston, um, Houston, and, and Tel Aviv. And uh, so, so it has been supported by NSF heavily, also by the Binational US uh, Israel Binational Science Foundation, and by and my my collaboration with uh, with the group of Ellen Pira and um, and Anna Mingutsi was was supported by by two uh, European grants. And thank you very much. So thank you very much for this wonderful presentation for, for keeping time very accurately. Thank you very much. And I see two um, questions in the, uh, in the question and answer section already. Yes, please. So there's a first question by Andreas Osterloh. And it says, can you explain how it comes that a however weak noise to the two solitons would separate them? What are the separation times I never heard about that working on the topic, not working on the topic so far. Right. So, so, so at, at the moment, if you, if you take uh, lithium experiments as an example, a typical separation time would be between one and five seconds. And uh, the absence of interactions between the, between the, between the solitons, I was thinking about it this morning, if I can give a physicist ex explanation for why, why it happens, and I don't have it yet. So it, it come, all I can say is, is something, uh, all I can say is, is that it's, it's, it's magic of the inverse scattering. Uh, but, but, but actually what is, what, what, what you will hear from me next time is, is indeed some simple general physics picture of, of why, uh, why solitons truly don't interact. And then again, since they don't interact, then, then quantum noise participates. Uh, and so this is, this is what I want to say. And this is all I can say at the moment. Okay, then there's a question by Angela. I, think, I guess it's Angela Förster. And he says, hi, Maxime, thanks for the excellent talk. I have a couple of questions and I read them, um, all three of them, and I think um, they can be answered shortly, I guess, if I read, understand them correctly. One is, how long do the breathers of your experiment survive? Uh, I wish, I wish Randy Hewlett would, would, would give this, this talk, but, but we definitely fee, see four periods of, of the breathing. Uh, and, and, and the rest, uh, uh, at least for periods, yes. 
but but there's no there's no at the moment we don't see any fundamental limitation on on it. It's just just it's just an experimental thing. So we they they wanted to see several periods and they saw several periods. Okay, so question number two is. Is it possible to extend your results experiments to multi-component both gases, two-component both gas, for example? Uh, we need to have solitons there. I mean, one can think about, about Monokov systems, so, so two coupled uh, both, uh, one-dimensional both condensates with equal inter uh, inter solid inter uh, species and intraspecies couplings. Uh, Uh, so I can see of, of one example, but but again, I mean, so what we must have is the lux, what's called the lux mechanism uh, behind it. We, we must have some inverse inverse scattering uh, machinery that that supports uh, the non-infecting solitons. But but the first thing I would think is is a two component both gas with all three coupling constants being being exactly equal to each other. So this this is called the Monokov system. And I think the third question is related to that anyway. Uh, and it sounds like, are you planning extensions of this work? I guess you gave some of the answers already. Extensions of this work, uh, it's, there is so many, uh, there's so many, so, so many eff uh, effects that we, we still need to understand. Um, Uh, if you look at the actual distributions of the in intersoliton distances after the, after the uh, uh, after all, all these procedures, so for example, there is there is a strong disparity between under rotation and, and over rotation, strong disparity between the positive and negative ne negative gradient, gradient gradient. In one case, there is a bifurcation; in another case, it's, it, it is not, and it is all coming from beyond integrability solid on solid on interactions and and even though i mean the results i mean you saw the results i mean uh, our non-understanding of what is happening doesn't contribute to the results of it but yeah, all of that need, needs to be understood I mean, it, it's it's an enormous it's an enormous it's an enormous project i mean it it, it there are about five independent effects that 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 are that are competing and they need to understand and, mit and mitigate in, in, in some, uh, so, so it's, it's a long way. I mean, you saw, I mean, we are it, uh, six, six papers, six papers into it. We are still, we're still midway. Okay, then there's one more question from the question and answer before I go to Luigi and the question is from by Roberta Citro. Do long range type interactions induce dissociation of the breathers? I, I I don't think so. So as I as I mentioned, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, the very notion of uh, a large cluster or a large molecule being split onto two two molecules doesn't make much sense. Uh, generally, doesn't make much sense when when one molecule sits inside inside another. I mean, what determines the separation what determines i mean how do you even count right and so uh and so if you don't have the uh inverse scattering magic on your side which would tell you that one molecule doesn't interact interact with it, with with another and at this very moment you can introduce a notion of the chemical composition at this very moment you can say all right okay, so, so i have I have one molecule of length one, another molecule of length three, few, a few uh, dimer, few dimer, few, few monomers, and so forth. But for that, the molecules or or, or the the clusters, they must not interact in order in order even to introduce a notion of how many of them them we have there. And generally speaking, if you don't have, okay, so let me list all 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 of those things which are really the same thing. If you don't have integrability. Or lux mechanism, which is the same thing uh, in this context, or inverse scattering, which is the same thing in this context, con context. or solitons, which are the same. Then, 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 the, yes, none of those effects will, will be there because, I mean, generally speaking, dip dipolar interactions don't, don't don't support it. So, so you really must have honest to goodness solitons that don't interact with each other, and 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 they uh, uh which the thing which is extremely specific to 
the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, and it doesn't exist anywhere else to my knowledge, is that the, when you create a breather, solitons don't interact inside the breather either. So, so and that, that's why this mechanism wouldn't, wouldn't work even for the, for the sine Gordon equation, because in the sine Gordon equation, you can also create a breather, but in the breather, the solitons will be, will be confined to each other still. So, so it, right, right. I mean, so, so 1D Bose gas, gas is, 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 ex, is extremely unique. I mean, so, so we can indeed, we can create, we can create a quantum cold microscopic degree, degree of freedom in, in completely ambient mean field condition. As, as all of us who know Bill, Bill um, left a question already earlier in the talk. Um, in, and the question is, um, I might ask, and this is at the beginning of the talk, that Maxime is being a little provoca provocative about saying that the two pieces don't interact. They do, I guess. But in the usual solitonic way, namely that after passing through each other, they remain unchanged. But there's plenty of interaction. Is this right? Uh, it is, it is and it isn't. Uh... Oh, okay, so so, so uh, right, Bill. So, so so it's correct that uh, there is atom atom interaction between between the solitons. Uh, this interaction, however, is completely compensated by the kinetic energy of of the solitons. And for all practical purposes, so when when the the these two constituent solitons reemerge from the breezer they reemerge with with zero energy so so they they do interact okay so so they do interact a bit, okay so the, the 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 better picture is a molecule on the verge of dissociation so uh in short i agree with the comment i mean this is this is probably a better a better picture so so there is an interaction but it is compensated exactly by the by the kinetic energy and so so they dissociate with with no, um, uh, with no, uh, they dissociate with no energy defect. And thanks for this comment. Uh, I will be yes. back. So, later. so it was. It was. Yeah. 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 Okay. Then let me read uh, uh, the next, the last final question, but maybe it's more a comment by Augustus Merzi, and it says, if I understand correctly, the theory is based on Grosz-Pedersky equation mean field. There is no quantum advantage in this case, since the one over n scaling comes from the mean field interactions, not from entanglement. Entanglement would provide an additional increase in sensitivity. So you want right. to more comment on that before we go on? Right. So so the uh, the propagation is is governed by the gross petrovsky but the initial state is quantum macroscopic coherence. So so so, so at, at the technical level, what we're doing is truncated Wigner, but what we're actually simulating is uh, a, a, is a propagation of uh, a quantum, fully quantum wave packet. Of the relative motion of, of two solitons, and and so the uh, and and so in particular the uh, area, the phase space area, the relative coordinate occupies is uh, is 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 comparable to uh, to Planck's constant. So so, so again, uh, so so truncated Wigner is a numerical method, but it's a numerical method to propagate. Uh, a, a truly quantum microscopic field, and this is this is what this is what we do. So, so it's just Grosz-Pedersky is technical. I mean, okay, thank you very much. So, I don't know if Luigi has his hand still open uh, because of the for the, the okay. Well, it's, a, it's a short question. So, it's a, a more on um, uh, back to the first question. So, the physical mechanism by a breather decay into solid. So, I thought uh, that uh, it was. A kind of pinning mechanism. So in our uh, paper together, Maxim, I think we saw, we studied how to pin the soliton, so we have an impurity, then I mean, it's pinned somewhere. So isn't uh, somehow related with the pinning? So if you have disorder, of course, the breather decay in the two solitons because of the pinning. Then I cannot explain what they drift. 
but then I was, uh, okay, this is the question is, am I correct? Uh, I went, so we do have, we do have a paper uh, on, on, on pinning and on interactions of, of, of the soliton, uh, of a soliton with barriers, but here in this project, we're trying to avoid any, any pinning. So, so that's, that's uh, uh, the relative motion needs to remain as free as possible. And, and they drift apart again because of the residual uh, quantum microscopic fluctu fluctuations. So, so zero, zero point Bogolubov's uh, excitations. But, but I mean, pinning is something that, that generally speaking, we want to avoid. Uh, we, we played, um, so there is one of the six papers uh, with Oleg Smarchukov as a first, so, first author. We played with the possibility of indeed inserting a narrow barrier in, in, in the middle of a breezer. To, to, to speed up the, the, the decomposition. But this, this, I mean, this is one of the methods. But, uh, but ideally, yes, ideally we would, we would, so, so we can use pinning as, as a way to, to separate the solitons, but, but, uh, but as they propagate, we want to avoid it. So, so that's, that's the thing. Thanks. Okay, so thank you very much. So thank you very much for this presentation, Maxime.